And good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kyle Smith with ICF, and I will be the moderator for today's event. I am going to provide a quick rundown of our agenda for today. Today's webinar focuses on research and reforms that address barriers to affordable housing. Just as a reminder, this is the third part of a four webinar series, and we will be having our final webinar next week focused around community engagement. To get us started, I am going to provide a quick rundown of our agenda for today. We will kick off our event today with opening remarks from De Principal Deputy Assistant Solomon Green, Secretary Solomon Green. Next, we will talk about research on regulatory barriers and how it affects housing. We will hear about how that research has been used to advance policy to remove barriers and real world examples from four other grantee communities that have made reforms to remove these barriers. At this time, I would like to pass it over to Landon Levin Jones, Community Planning and Development Specialist with HUD to introduce a special guest from the HUD leadership team. Over to you, Landon. Thank you, Kyle. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Landon Levin Jones, and I serve as Community Planning and Development Specialist here at HUD. It is my honor to introduce our Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy, Development, and Research, Solomon Green. Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Green lead, leads HUD's Office of Policy, Development, and Research, which informs policy development and implementation to improve life in American communities through conducting, supporting, and sharing research, surveys, demonstrations, program evaluations, and best practices. Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Green has dedicated his career to improving people's lives and strengthening communities through evidence-based and community-driven housing and urban development policies. Prior to joining HUD, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Green held leadership positions in research institutions, affordable housing and community development organizations, local and federal governments, and philanthropic organizations. For over seven years, he was a senior fellow at the Urban Institute, where he led research on fair and affordable housing, land use, technology, and inclusive growth and recovery in cities. Before joining the Urban Institute, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Green served as senior advisor at HUD, where he helped develop policies and reduce segregation and expand neighborhood choice, and served as HUD's principal advisor on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Green has also served as a senior program officer at the Open Society Foundations, as an adjunct professor at NYU's Wagner Graduate School of Public Service, a law fellow at NYU's Furman Center for Real Estate and Urban Policy, as a litigation associate at Munger, Tolles, and Olson, and a law clerk on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. He has served on the board of directors for the National Housing Law Project, the American Bar Association's COVID-19 Task Force Committee on Evictions, and the Advisory Board for Up for Growth. Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Green received his bachelor's degree from Stanford University, his Master's of Community Planning from the University of California, Berkeley, and his Juris Doctorate from Yale Law School. He grew up in Ulster County, New York, and currently lives in Washington, D.C. Please join me in welcoming Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Solomon Green. Thank you, Landon, for that kind introduction. And thank you to Sharita, Kyle, and the entire team at ICF uh, for organizing and hosting this webinar series. And thank you to all of you for joining us today. I'm very excited to welcome you to today's webinar, Research on the Barriers to Affordable Housing. At the start of the webinar series, we learned about the ways the consolidated plan process can be useful to identify local barriers to affordable housing and support local policy action to remove such barriers. Last week, during the second webinar, we discussed how you can use data to understand the affordable housing needs in your community. Once you have a scope of those needs, the next step is to identify the barriers to having more affordable housing. And that is the focus of today's webinar. What are the regulatory barriers that make it difficult to improve our housing supply and expand affordable housing? And what are some promising regulatory reforms states and localities are adopting to address those barriers? Now, housing supply challenges have received significant spotlight and attention in recent years. Communities across the country are struggling to build enough housing to meet the demand, contributing to a shortfall of more than 3.8 million units nationwide. Restrictive land use and zoning laws are major drivers of the national housing shortage. 
These policies can artificially limit housing construction and increase costs, limit economic growth, and maintain residential segregation. In response to increasing housing affordability pressures and the widespread recognition of the role that barriers have played in this housing crisis, cities and counties across the country are taking a hard look at their local land use laws and procedures and adopting innovative reforms that can help unleash housing supply. Since local governments play the most significant role in regulating land use, they are well positioned to identify and adopt reforms tailored to their local housing market. But state governments have an important role to play too. They can use, they often have broad authority to set the rules by which local governments can regulate land uses, and they create accountability mechanisms to incentivize local pro-housing reforms. While regulatory barriers to housing production fall primarily under the umbrella of state and local governments, closing the housing supply gap is a top federal priority. Producing and preserving affordable housing is core to HUD's mission, and HUD has worked to support local jurisdictions' actions to boost housing uh, supply. HUD has joined other federal, federal agencies in taking administrative actions to increase housing supply, and the federal government allocates billions of dollars each year through tax credits and block grants to support affordable housing production and preservation. Our hope is that this webinar series will serve as an additional resource for local jurisdictions interested in tackling the barriers that have contributed to the chronic undersupply of housing. For today's topic in particular, I want to note that as a researcher, I've seen an important shift in the research on regulatory barriers to affordable housing from demonstrating the impact that local restrictive uh, land use laws have on housing, housing supply to understanding what reforms work and in which contexts. Research can help both diagnose problems and point to solutions, but it is local leaders that must ultimately apply that research to address their community's needs. That is why it is so important to have both a research and practice perspective on the webinar today. The webinar will begin by providing an overview of research on regulatory barriers from Emily Hamilton at the Mercatus Center. After that, we'll hear about an example from the state of Montana of using research to advance policies that remove regulatory barriers. The webinar will conclude with an exciting panel of local leaders from our grantee communities that will talk about their great and innovative local programs and highlight different evidence-based approaches to removing barriers. As you can see, there's a lot to cover in this webinar, so I'll turn it right over to our moderator, Kyle Smith. Thank you, Principal Deputy Assistant Green. At this time, I would like to introduce our presenters for today. Uh, today we have with us Emily Hamilton, a Senior Research Fellow and Director of the Urbanity Project at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Kendall Cotton, a Government's Relations Professional uh, and President and CEO of the Frontier Institute. Lorena McDowell, who leads Lake County's Department of Housing Affordability and Community Revitalization. Tim Kukorin, the Director of Planning and Community Resources for the City of South Bend. Emily Liu, the Planning Director for Louisville, Kentucky, overseeing planning, urban design, and historic preservation functions for the city. And finally, Greg Sandland, the Planning Director for the City of Sacramento. With that, we will get started. Uh, as a reminder, we will be taking Q&A midway through the presentation and again at the end. We encourage you to submit your questions to the WebEx Q&A throughout. And now I would like to hand it over to Emily Hamilton, who will discuss some research about regulatory barriers and its effect on housing affordability. Thanks so much, Kyle. Thank you to PDNR and to all of you who are joining us this afternoon. Uh, I'm an economist, so I come to this issue from a particular lens, but there's a growing body of interdisciplinary research that shows a clear relationship between zoning and other land use regulations and their effect on reducing the supply of housing, especially relatively low cost types of housing and driving up housing prices and rent. Next slide, please, Kyle. 
Here we can see a visualization of that relationship on the uh, x-axis here, we can see the Wharton Residential Land Use Regulatory Index of some of the country's largest metropolitan areas. And on the y-axis, their uh, house prices in thousands of dollars. You'll hear uh, momentarily from Kendall about improved measures of assessing the barriers that zoning presents to housing supply. But right now, this Wharton Index, which is a survey sent to municipalities across the country, is the best nationwide indicator that we have. And we see here that in those places where zoning and other land use regulations make it most difficult to build new housing, prices are highest. Here we're looking at market rate prices, but it's equally true that these land use restrictions reduce the amount of subsidized housing that we can get uh, per dollar spent. And I'll talk now about two particular reforms that have been proven successful in addressing these problems and what we know about how they've played out. Next slide, please. The first of those two reforms is on tr is the approach of transit oriented development, particularly where I live in Arlington, Virginia. Starting in the 1960s, policymakers in Arlington were facing some fiscal challenges and a study of public expenditures and tax revenues in the county revealed that multifamily housing was paying more to county tax rolls than its residents were requiring in public services, while it was the opposite for single family housing, which was um, not uh, paying for itself in terms of property tax revenues uh, relative to public services. And this finding combined with the, the need to implement some fiscal reforms in Arlington sent the county on a path of legalizing more multifamily housing construction in some of its commercial corridors. And then as you can see in this picture here, that was accelerated with the coming of the orange line and later the blue line metro rail stations throughout the county where uh, following the, the opening of those stations, county policymakers have increased the opportunities to build more multifamily housing around them. Next slide, please. In these maps, you can see the effects of those reforms just in the most recent two decades in terms of allowing more people to live in Arlington. Throughout this, um, approach of attempting to legalize more multifamily housing, the county's population has increased by about 60,000 people. And it's a small county with just about 16 square miles of developable area. So that's a, a lot of infill housing that we're talking about. Here you can see on the left, the census tracts and their population densities in 2000 relative to on the right in 2020. And we can see just in the number of census tracts that the county has, there's been a lot of densification around the orange line stations, which are highlighted here, as well as in parts of the, the southern part of the county on a couple of different transit corridors there. Today, the county's densest census tracts are over 30,000 people per square kilometer, which makes them among some of the, the densest neighborhoods in the country. And following this experience in Arlington, um, in part perhaps um, as a response and perhaps just of their own initiative, policymakers in, um, in neighboring jurisdictions have followed a similar path. In Washington, D.C. itself, there are a few particular cases of formerly industrial neighborhoods and commercial neighborhoods where lots of apartment construction has been permitted. Similarly, in Montgomery County, Maryland, and in Fairfax County, Virginia, there's the clearest case of Arlington's model being replicated along their Silver Line stations there. Next slide, please. And here we can see how the DC region's affordability compares to some other peer regions. Here we have the six regions that are sometimes referred to as the country's superstar cities. 
these are regions that have particularly high concentrations of high paying jobs and high rates of productivity. And we can see that among those six regions, DC is the most affordable in terms of median house price uh, and also in terms of rent where the picture is actually even starker. Among these regions, Seattle is another clear case of adopting the um, favorable approach toward transit oriented development. Notably in Seattle, that's largely been around corridors that are served by bus rather than rail. But in the other cases, New York, Los Angeles, Boston, and San Francisco, there are many examples of rail stations that are surrounded by low density development, which is locked in by local zoning rules. Many different factors drive affordability differences across these regions, but certainly the DC's regions um, accepting this toward apartment construction is one factor that's helped it be the most affordable among the superstar regions. Next slide, please, Kyle. Now I'll turn to the second uh, case of reform that I want to highlight today, which is minimum lot size reduction in the city of Houston. Starting in 1998, policymakers there reduced the city's minimum lot size from 5,000 square feet, which is already quite small compared to what we see in a lot of um, cities and counties across the country in other, in other parts of the country. But they reduced it from 5,000 square feet down to 1,400 square feet. And initially, the 1998 reform applied to the land within the I-610 loop, which is the core of the city of Houston. But based on the success of that 1998 reform, they expanded it to, to apply to the city as a whole. And we can see in many neighborhoods across Houston, there are examples of these small lot single family houses like you see here. These are detached townhouses, as most small lot uh, construction is in Houston, and they call them townhouses, even though they are um, slightly detached. Uh, but we can see lots of examples of attached townhouses there as well. Next slide, please. The uh, supply response in terms of uh, how home builders have responded to this opportunity for small lot construction has been uh, very impressive. About 40,000 small lot houses have been built in Houston uh, that have been made possible because of this reform. You can see that there was uh, a real um, uptick in building this small lot development prior to the financial crisis that uh, has not yet recovered. But uh, both inside and outside the I-610 loop, there has been a lot of this type of construction. And just allowing houses to be built on smaller pieces of land creates big opportunities for less expensive construction since each new house can come with a less expensive piece of land. Next slide, slide please. And again, uh, here's a comparison of the Houston Metro prices compared to some of its peer cities, which are other large regions in the Sun Belt that, like Houston, don't face a lot of geographic constraints. And again, there are, are many factors contributing to Houston's relative affordability. But if we look at its median house price relative to median income in the Houston region, it is faring the best uh, in terms of affordability relative to its peers. Houston uh, is the only city in the US uh, that doesn't have use zoning. So small lot to housing uh, as well as a housing of any type can be built in a commercial, what would be a commercial zone in another region. Um, and it's also quite accepting of, um, of multifamily housing as a result of this general approach to land use regulations. But we see as a whole, uh, Houston is faring quite well in terms of affordability and small lot townhouse construction is one piece of that story. Thanks so much. And I will turn it over to Kendall.
Thanks, Emily, and uh, great to be here. Um, I'm going to kind of walk everybody through uh, our journey with housing affordability here in Montana. Uh, as Kyle mentioned, I'm with the Frontier Institute based here in Helena, Montana, and we started looking at housing affordability about two years ago. Uh, when Montana was seeing a massive population influx um, directly after the, the, the start of the pandemic. Lots of people were moving into Montana, and that was creating a lot of pressure on our housing market. And uh, one of the things that we, we noticed was, you know, this was the top issue for people, everyday Montanans. Um, if you walk down the street and stop somebody on the sidewalk, they were concerned about housing affordability. In some markets like Bozeman, Montana, which is a growing, fast growing college town, uh, the median home price for a time was at $850,000. So uh, this was a significant problem in Montana. And uh, we noticed that there was a strong skepticism from local leaders that zoning reform was a, a viable strategy for addressing this housing crisis. And, you know, as Emily laid out, uh, the, the existing research out there, as well as some of the examples nationally, uh, suggest that zoning does play a significant role in housing affordability, and reform could be uh, one of the tactics that we take to address this housing affordability crisis that we were seeing in our state. So we took on the Montana Zoning Atlas project. And uh, Kyle, if you'll advance to the next slide, please. So the Montana Zoning Atlas uh, uses a standardized methodology that was actually uh, developed by researchers at Cornell uh, with the National Zoning Atlas Project. And we use that uh, to evaluate 13 of the fastest growing counties in Montana that were seeing some of the biggest pressure of population growth. And we, we visualized in an interactive map format uh, where you can build things like duplexes, which are uh, some of this missing middle style uh, uh, housing design that tends to be more affordable and where you can't build that sort of housing. And one of the things that we found with our zoning atlas is that by and large, the major cities in Montana uh, overwhelmingly uh, reserve the majorities of their cities for uh, expensive single family home types on large lots rather than slightly denser, more affordable types of homes like uh, this missing middle multifamily developments like duplexes and triplexes. Um, Kyle, if you'll advance to the next slide. So overall, broadly, you know, across all the counties that we measured, we found that 50% of zone land um, either outright prohibits or what we call penalizes by requiring additional regulatory hoops this affordable multifamily uh, starter form uh, starter homes like duplexes. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm just going to walk you through uh, a quick example of what we were able to show local leaders and state lawmakers who were skeptical of zoning reform and also concerned about housing affordability. So we this example will focus right in on uh, Missoula, Montana, which is one of Montana's largest cities and also one of the fastest growing housing markets in our state. And we say that it's a it's a prime example of how these strict local zoning regulations like minimum lot sizes, for instance, uh, end up excluding low and middle income residents by um, by zoning out the most affordable types of homes. So next slide, please. All right, so um, if you look at this map here, you'll see that uh, only 23% of the primary residential zones in Missoula welcome more affordable duplexes or townhomes via an explicit by right zoning designation. And I guess I should back up here and explain why we're focused on homes like duplexes or townhomes. Um, compared to single family homes, the research is very clear. And in fact, if you talk to any you know home builder, they'll say that uh, missing middle style development, these multi-unit developments like duplexes are simply cheaper to build compared to single family homes. And so excluding those via zoning from communities has a big impact on the available affordable homes in a community. Uh, next slide, please. Even less land in Missoula welcomes uh, triplexes or above via an explicit by right zoning designation. Next slide, please. One of the interesting things that we found and were able to demonstrate through our research to local leaders and state lawmakers was that even in areas where uh, theoretically things like duplexes are allowed, um, 
the underlying minimum lot size constraints that were placed on uh, those lots via zoning uh, actually preempted that sort of development and created what we called de facto single family zoning. So you'll see on the map here, the light pink areas represent areas where on paper, the zoning uh, use designations allow for duplex development or above, but the minimum lot sizes required to build a duplex actually exceeds the dimensions of the existing lots and uh, zones out that sort of development from those areas. So next slide, please. So again, that brings us to this ever shrinking area in Montana cities that accommodate and welcome the, the most affordable style development, this missing middle duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, et cetera. Uh, next slide. So zooming out from just Montana, you know, we found that this was a trend in most of Montana's major cities, uh, reserving essentially the majority of Montana city or uh, of, of the cities for uh, the most expensive sorts of homes, single family homes on large lots and zoning out the most affordable types of homes like duplexes and townhomes and uh, condominiums. Uh, next slide, please. We also were able to show uh, lawmakers and local leaders uh, comparisons between cities, and that was really helpful in demonstrating um, opportunities for reform. Some cities we found in Montana don't even impose minimum lot sizes at all. For instance, Helena, Montana, where I live, uh, completely abolished minimum lot sizes in 2019, and um, the sky didn't fall. You know, we're, we're still building homes here, and people are safe, and we have great, thriving neighborhoods. So um, being able to map this out and show people, you know, what other communities look like was a really important uh, thing for us to uh, urge reform in Montana. Next slide, please. All right, so I'm just gonna run through really quickly uh, the reforms that Montana was able to pass this spring and that uh, we as an organization um, and as a coalition here in Montana, were able to play a role in um, that our research really sparked uh, early on since two years ago. Um, so Senate Bill 323 uh, was focused on, we called that the duplex bill, but essentially it broadly restores the rights of landowners in Montana to build duplexes or two units on a piece of land. So everywhere where single family homes are allowed, you can now build a duplex in cities above 5,000 population. Additionally, zoning regulations that are imposed on uh, duplexes or, or two unit homes uh, cannot be more strict than what are uh, imposed on single family homes. Um, that's one, that's the, the first, probably the, the most clear cut bill. Uh, the next bill that I'll mention is Senate Bill 382, and that was referred to as the big bill. That was like a 50 page bill, and it represents a complete overhaul of Montana's land use planning statutes. Um, essentially, it implements a new comprehensive planning process for uh, cities in our major cities in our state. And uh, once that comprehensive planning process is done, um, they'll be inviting public comment the whole way, uh, getting everybody to the table. And once the rules of the game are agreed to, essentially when the zoning map is created, uh, the new zoning map is created under this new comprehensive planning process, um, the uh, the need for additional public hearings is completely eliminated. So any development after that point will only need an administrative review. So that dramatically streamlines the, dev the development and permitting process for all sorts of housing and addresses some of these uh, contentious public hearings where the neighbors turn out and oppose development. Additionally, it's gonna actually require governments to adjust their zoning map to accommodate future population growth and future housing needs so that hopefully our housing production can actually keep up with um, demand. Additionally, uh, we worked on establishing a menu of zoning reform options that cities are gonna be required to implement. And one of the last points I'll mention for that big bill is that it also requires that manufactured housing be treated equally to uh, traditional housing. Um, and I think that that's a big success for housing affordability as well. Next slide, please. All right, Montana also passed a bill to allow and enable accessory dwelling units. Uh, that was Senate Bill 528, and it essentially requires all municipalities to allow at least one attached, detached, or internal accessory dwelling unit. 
Um, it also addresses uh, many of the, the what we call poison pills that we've seen uh, other localities that have attempted uh, ADU reform um, th uh, that they've used to kind of get around allowing ADUs. So, for example, um, we're uh, cities after this bill is implemented cannot require that ADUs be owner occupied. They can't mandate any additional parking be required for uh, a lot that uh, has ADU development. They can't assess additional impact fees for this development, et cetera. Senate Bill 245 uh, was another bill that was more focused on kind of this mixed use style development in commercial areas, focused on city centers in cities uh, with 7,000 population and up. It broadly restores the right of landowners there to uh, build multifamily and mixed use apartments in commercial zones. And it also addresses some of the parking mandates that local governments impose on this sorts of development, uh, limiting those mandates to being no more requiring no more than one off street parking spot per unit. Uh, next slide, please. Great. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> I'll throw it back to Kyle. Thank you, Kendall, and thank you, uh, Emily, both of you, for sharing this great information. We have time for one or maybe two questions from our researchers. Uh, I have actually been monitoring the chat, um, and I have seen a couple of questions, uh, one of which asking to uh, define ADUs, which one of our uh, guests has spelled out. Uh, but I would like to ask another question um, that you've all been chatting about already, and this is um, oriented at Emily, but um, perhaps you both have thoughts on it. Emily, your presentation noted that in Arlington, planners discovered that multifamily development uh, paid for itself uh, in greater tax revenue than single family uh, development. Uh, however, uh, one of our attendees has noted that different kinds of development, residential development, do use different kinds of services and the apples to apples comparison might not be fair. Um, could you elaborate on your response in, um, uh, in the chat uh, as to how to compare the two? Sure. Um, yeah, that's a great question that I'm glad that came up in the chat. And to clarify, I don't even think that we should expect um, all types of development to pay for itself. For example, low cost housing uh, that's home to lots of school children won't pay for itself in almost any circumstance, but it's a type of development that's nonetheless essential for all of our communities. Uh, but I do just want to emphasize that in the Arlington context, this finding that on average, residents of apartment buildings paid more in taxes than they required in services, and that the opposite was true for single family houses uh, was an important component of policymakers' willingness to zone for increased apartment construction in Arlington. Uh, and I think this this finding goes against what a lot of people may think of as the con conventional wisdom on fiscal zoning. Uh, which might be that the more expensive a unit of housing is, the more likely it is to pay for itself in um, in tax revenues, which was the the opposite of what was the case in Arlington. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, and thank you both um, for your presentations. Uh, we are a little bit behind schedule, and we'd like to move to the next part of our program for today, um, but there will be time for additional Q&A at the end of the session uh, for Emily uh, and for Kendall, and we do have a very active chat box, uh, so please, we will come back to your questions at the end. At this time, I would like to transition us over to a discussion about regulatory reform from a practitioner point of view. Uh, we hope that by sharing with all of you some specific examples of how other communities have been tackling barriers to housing uh, through regulatory reform, you can get some innovative ideas as to how to pursue this in your own community. And I'd like to introduce our four grantee panelists by asking them all to come on camera. Today, we are joined uh, by Lorena McDowell of Wake County, North Carolina, Tim Kukorin of South Bend, Indiana, Emily Liu of Louisville, Kentucky, uh, and Greg Sandland of Sacramento, California. So first of all, welcome to all of you. 
We heard our researchers share some important information about existing information on regulatory reform and the role of resource research in advancing policy reforms and overcoming some of the barriers. Uh, we want to talk to you now about the different approaches that you all have taken to address these challenges in your communities. Uh, before asking you some questions, I just want to note that there are a lot of different approaches to remove barriers to housing development. Some, on the one hand, approach, uh, approaches focus on creating new financial incentives that encourage the production of new affordable units. Uh, others create regulatory and zoning flexibility to expand housing supply uh, and reduce the cost of uh, development for investors. And some uh, provide a combination of the two. So I'm going to ask you each a few questions about your approaches uh, and why you chose the route that you did. Uh, Lorena, I'm going to start with you. Wake County has recently adopted a new affordable housing incentive program, which allows developers to apply for county funds in exchange for providing affordable units. What is it exactly is the program? What are its benefits and why did Wake County decide to take this approach? Sure, thank you. Uh, so Wake County is um, in a state that has to be that does not allow inclusionary zoning. So we cannot legally mandate affordable housing development here. Um, in our state. And so we've had to be pretty aggressive in our approach to incentivize preservation and development, um, especially in the second fastest growing county in the nation. So uh, Wake has taken kind of a three pronged approach to addressing our lack of affordable housing stock, and it's been to incentivize development of new affordable housing, preserve our existing naturally occurring affordable housing or NOAA, and to educate and incentivize existing landlords to reduce or remove requirements that they may have um, that create barriers for our low-income housing residents to their units. And to do this, we have multiple programs, some of which you see on your screen. The largest program that we run um, is our Affordable Housing Development Program, or AHDP. Um, and through the use of a penny tax, this program provides an average of $10 million annually to get finance uh, projects. And so developers can take advantage of this funding to create or preserve affordable housing. And funded projects can utilize income averaging within their unit mix as long as it averages out to serving 60% of the area median income or AMI. They can utilize low income housing tax credits as well, although it is not required. And the more affordability they offer us and or the more they focus on specialty populations as defined by our local need, the more funding they can ask us for. Um, however, for our dollars, we require a minimum 20% set aside for housing vouchers in each funded project, and we aim for a 30 year affordability period as well. And although participation is not is it's voluntary, it's not required in this program. Once our funding is accepted, the projects are now legally bound to the terms of our agreement, thus creating legally binding affordable housing in a non-inclusionary zoning state. That is a very compelling program. Uh, I am wondering if you've had any success stories uh, to date uh, from the program so far. Absolutely. So the last bullet point um, in the first chunk of the slide um, kind of tells the story. So we set out an initial goal of creating or preserving over 2,500 units in the first five years. Um, through this AHD program alone, we hit our goal in year three. And now, just entering into year five, we are set at over 3,500 units to be preserved or created. And we'll continue to focus on preserving and developing affordable units, as well as engaging and incentivizing landlords and property management companies. Our preservation fund, which also recently launched at just about $62 million, is beginning now to work on preserving units all across Wake County to ensure they remain affordable as well. That is a great success story. I'd like to shift gears now uh, to Tim from South Bend. Another way that communities can address barriers is by making the regulations more flexible. Uh, this allows developers to build more of the different kinds of housing that we want to need and can lead to more affordability. So Tim, tell us about the zoning changes that South Bend recently made and why it also then created, why the city also then created pre-approved building types to encourage developers to apply. What did you do and why did you choose to do it? Thanks Kyle and thank you for having me on the, this uh, webinar today, appreciate it. So uh, yeah, we embarked on a zoning reform starting back in 2018, where we decided to do an incremental approach to zoning reform by doing a series of small scale interventions to our uh, uh, 
old zoning ordinance uh, as we were rewriting uh, the whole document internally. And what we ended up doing was cutting over 250 pages of of regulatory uh, 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 framework that just didn't make sense for our city. So uh, in the process, uh, we, we, we developed a uh, sort of a form-based code for the city of South Bend. And one of the key instruments or key uh, 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 initiatives was mm -hmm. to develop a missing middle housing zone. Uh, and the way we did that with almost no sort of controversy was by creating the regulatory element of that, that new zoning classification, but without having it mapped anywhere within the city. And through a series of neighborhood planning efforts, we then uh, incrementally started remapping our city uh, sort of one neighborhood at a time using um, this sort of incremental approach. Uh, with the overall um, zoning update, we also were able to uh, permit by right accessory dwelling units uh, across the city on every parcel. We dramatically reduced minimum uh, lot sizes and uh, rationalized all the setbacks and basically and, and, and also eliminated all off street parking requirements uh, across the city. And, and really, in a way, what we're trying to tackle is in, 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 a, in a sort of a bigger philosophical sense is, is this suburban bias that sort of runs through our culture and re reducing or eliminating uh, all of those sort of suburban biased regulatory uh, um, framework that had been part of South Bend's uh, zoning ordinance. So, um, you know, th that was a big initial step to allowing for uh, that broader range of housing typologies that we know we need, not only from affordability, but also from demographic changes and, um, and just housing choice generally. And, and one of the things that we wanted to do is, and, and, and what we've been finding is that unlike many of the you know, other communities that are speaking today where there's a high growth uh, cities, you know, South Bend and, and is a is sort of a slow growth city. And, uh, you know, we are we are growing, but very, very, very slowly. And so what we wanted to do is be very proactive in our approach to how we uh, think of development. And one of the ways we've done that is by developing a set of pre-approved housing plans. Now these are um, sort of harken back to the Sears catalog of, of that uh, of housing plans that were available in the past, and and using these as a way to help uh, small scale developers in our community who are really looking to heal what is what have been really damaged neighborhoods that have uh, seen a lot of disinvestment over the last you know since since uh, sort of World War II post war times and the suburbanization of our community and really looking at ways to heal our neighborhoods. And so the city is providing tools like the pre-approved plans to help uh, people uh, in these neighborhoods uh, drive the change that they want to see for their neighborhoods. So it was really important for us to uh, tune these plans to the South Bend development pattern. We analyzed uh, our lots, we analyzed how the city developed in the past, and we wanted to be able to illustrate how you can use lots that were that are already platted that oftentimes people think are too small, um, uh, how those lots can be reused. So we really focused first on sort of the smaller scale uh, housing and the smaller scale missing middle uh, product, the stack duplex um, and side by side duplex. All of these housing plans were very pro forma based and were driven by by a pro forma. Uh, so, for instance, you don't see a fourplex right now, but that's uh, but we we will probably get to that over time. Again, we take an incremental approach to everything, but it, it, it's what led us to choose a sixplex uh, as one of the first uh, housing typologies that we that we uh, developed. Um, we then vetted all of these plans with a local builders to ensure buildability and that uh, that there would drive acceptance by the building community, and again. We really looked to our small scale developer community to help us pick the types of, uh, of housing that we would choose to do now and what, what our next uh, set of housing plans will be. 
so that we know that we have uh, the sort of buy-in from um, from our from our local builders and neighborhoods. And Thank you, Tim. Um, I I wanted to actually ask you how the development market has uh, has responded um, to the pre-approved building type so far. Yeah, well, like I said, South Bend is it's a slow growth place, but we've been very uh, very encouraged by what's been happening. So. In the upper left corner, you'll see our narrow house uh, uh, pre-approved plan uh, that has just been built. Um, we, uh, like I said, the ADU ordinance changes has really been popular, especially with new home construction. Uh, townhouses, a uh, lot more have been developed. Our minimum lot size is very small. Uh, our first urban permitted fourplex is, is under construction and almost finished and a stack duplex. Uh, also, all of these are within, you know, the last few months and years. And I think that, uh, you know, that, uh, and these are all in neighborhoods that have, that have like huge problems with appraisal gaps and, and uh, a lot of disinvestment in the neighborhood. So it's really trying to turn around an entire mar uh, housing market that's been, um, been really damaged uh, over the years. So we are seeing incremental success. And I would think that probably the best thing that's come out of this is we've had a, a low income tax credit project that is using our pre-approved plans to develop 50 lease to own um, um, dwellings. And during uh, the rezoning process, uh, they, they said the pre-approved plans were a godsend to them because it really brought down that cost of construction for them. They knew these housing types would be accepted in the neighbor in the neighborhoods that they were going to be building in and it just made that path for them so much easier and so um we hope to see about 50 more uh new units coming soon that is remarkable thank you for sharing all of that progress tim i wanted to now turn to you emily uh, to discuss the approach in the city of louisville uh, your city chose to focus on accessory dwelling units and what is compelling about your example is that you decided not just to allow them by right, but you also educated homeowners about how to build them. Can you give us a brief description of your EDU program? Sure. Um, thank you, Kyle. Uh, first of all, I'm very excited to be here today to share our recent experience with ADUs in Louisville. A little bit background, Louisville is a consolidated government with a huge, it's a huge area. 400 square miles, we have an urban area, a, a large suburban area, and also a lot of undeveloped uh, land uh, with a population of nearly 800,000 as of 2020. Um, so back in the summer of 2020, our city began also similar to South Bend, an incremental approach of zoning reform. So we started zoning reform in the summer of 2020. Uh, as as I, I said, it's an incremental approach. We started small, and ADU is part of phase one of that effort. Uh, the process of changing ADU regulation took a total of about a year. I would like to say that it was really a teamwork, committee effort, and a collaboration with many different organizations. Uh, first of all, uh, I have a we are lucky to have very dedicated staff. Um, we don't have a full time staff doing the reform work at the time. So we basically ask staff to volunteer. I know they all have a volunteer uh, spirit here and also have a full time job. I ended up with 20 planners in our office sign up to do this reform work um, kind of on the side. We also identify a few key champions from our lawmakers. At the end of the day, ADU regulation is a zoning. Zoning is law, so it has to be passed by lawmakers. So we work closely with a couple lawmakers. We have 26 Metro Council members. So in order for this pass, we need a majority, which is 14 votes. So we have a couple of lawmakers really champion for us on this. They are the one who would go to a public meeting. Uh, they will open up the meeting and they are there to support us. Uh, we also uh, have a group of kind of uh, organizations supporting us, including um, you know, Housing Advocacy Group and also AARP, uh, American Association of Retired Persons. If your community wants to do ADU, 
you have not talked to ARP, you need to do that. They are a great champion for you. And they also provide a lot of resources. So we that's kind of the team that we have. We spent about the first eight months uh, doing research and public engagement. So part of research, we we are also very lucky to have support from Urban Institute. Mr. Solomon Green was at Urban Institute at the time and helped us on this project and his team helped us. Uh, but anyway, and then the last four months, uh, it was really adoption process. We drafted the language back in uh, February of 2021. And by June, this was adopted. I was a little surprised because during the process, it was controversial. Even though it's small, ADU was actually pretty controversial. A lot of people just, I don't want renter to my in my you know in my neighborhood. Uh, I'm okay if it's um owner occupied. I just don't want those renters. So a lot of the traffic, storm water became an issue. Um, but um, the reason we team up with some advocacy group, they were able to um, uh, you know start working with us. Um, sometimes our office it, it was a lot of pushback. It's very hard for. Uh, us to defend ourselves and they will uh, step up like uh, the, the group actually wrote an op-ed at the new, uh, local newspaper, AARP, right before the passing of this organization, uh, placed a legal ad in, in the Courier Journal local newspaper uh, about the uh, ADU. So we got a lot of support. Uh, the process, I, I just want you to know that from the draft, the final adoption, there are a few changes. The lawmaker have some concerns. We'll be able to work with them, address them concern. One of them is short-term rental. Um, they feel like short-term rental should not be allowed uh, ADU by right. So we added language uh, that if you want to do short-term rental in the ADU, you need a conditional use permit. So those are some of the um, comments concerns the lawmaker have. And we'll be able to address address them quickly. So by the end uh, of the 26 members, uh, Metro Council member, 23 voted for us. I'm very pleased with the outcome. Uh, so because our city is urban, suburban, and some undeveloped area, if you city have any questions, um, I will be happy to connect with you. Um, each uh, area is a little different, actually. Wonderful. Thank you, Emily. Uh, and we are running a little little short on time, and so I wanted to move to our final uh, panelist, uh, and that is Greg. Uh, and Emily, I think you provided a nice segue into this. Every how Greg, every housing market is a little bit different. Um, in your community, you chose to use a combination of these tools uh, for a very long period of time. You've been at this since 2009, 2010. Could you share with us all of the different approaches that the city of Sacramento has taken uh, and why you took those various approaches at times? Well, yeah, it, it all started with our general plan or what many of you all call comprehensive plan. Um, that was inspired by a regional blueprint that got a lot of national media um, promoting infill development. And so that's what we did. We went from a suburban growth model to an infill growth model with increased heights, densities, focused on commercial corridors and centers growth around transit. Um, then we moved on to our zoning, starting with parking. We had dabbled with special planning districts with reductions. We finally went with a citywide context-based approach to reducing or eliminating parking. That was so successful. It had a lot of stakeholders support from environmentalists, business, housing advocates. Everyone wanted reduced parking, except for maybe some upset neighbors, but it went over well combined with good parking management. Because of that success, we overhauled our zoning code during the recession in-house, um, increased our densities, heights, and our base zones, had more land use flexibility, entitled our, con our uh, sorry, consolidated our entitlements, um, allowed for staff level approval of a lot of uh, projects, large projects, allowed multifamily housing as a permitted use um, in commercial zones, and in 2018, we pivoted to our transit areas. There was concern about allowing auto-oriented uses near, near transit stations. So we prohibited a lot of those uses while at the same time eliminating minimum parking requirements within a quarter mile and reducing them by 50% around those stations. And then in 2020, our Planning and Design Commission took the initiative to 
to push down entitlement approval, more entitlement approval to staff level and director level decisions. So it's very rare for any type of housing to go to the council, even on appeal. Um, also, area specific planning infrastructure can really uh, constrain development, even when you have good zoning. So analyzing your what you're planning to do in terms of growth, looking at the infrastructure needs and coming up with a finance plan to pay for it, often including an impact fee to spread the cost out. Speaking of impact fees, though, we wanted to simplify them. We have quite a few in California with our restrictions on property tax revenue. So we consolidated the program under a single ordinance to assess them consistently, credit them consistently, make them more predictable for development. We also deferred impact fees till final inspection for most housing development. That's a very popular program. And then of course, for capital A affordable housing, we eliminated city impact fees for each unit. This has been an expensive program for the city. We've allocated about $13 million since 2018 to do this, but it's leveraged over 2000 new units. Um, other things to note is of course, ADUs also we allow two per lot in our city. And of course, this, well, not of course, but the state of California has passed this now, allowing essentially three per unit um, in our state in light of the housing crisis we have. Um, empirically, we've looked at other large jurisdictions in California and we look at housing units per thousand residents. Um, we lead San Francisco, San Jose, Oakland, Long Beach, um, Oh, LA still has this beat and that's great. They're the largest city in California, so good for them. Um, but how do we go about it? Uh, a big factor is a general plan maintenance fee that helps to implement the general plan. We charge $2.64 per thousand dollars of building permit valuation. That has helped to pay for a staff now of about eight long range planners, other ordinance specialists that can work on this, these regulatory improvements on an ongoing basis. Um, I think I'll stop there. Wonderful. Thank you, Greg. And that is just incredible to hear about all of the different successes you've had uh, and how you've performed uh, relative to your peer cities. I wanted to summarize a few of the items uh, we heard today from today's webinar. Uh, first, we learned that research shows that restrictive regulatory environments increase housing prices, and that can contribute to affordable housing barriers. Uh, in particular, Local housing regulations such as zoning codes can create long lasting barriers to affordable housing supply within a particular community. Uh, on the other hand, regulatory reforms can help mitigate many of these barriers. Localities that take different approaches, such as removing exclusionary zoning laws and reducing lot minimums, can encourage the development of multifamily homes and increase their affordable housing supply. The types of zoning code revisions that may increase affordable housing. Uh, are some that you heard about today, and they can include reduced parking requirements, increasing allowable density and heights, flexibility in land use, entitlement consolidation. Uh, however, uh, as we also heard from our grantee panelists, ongoing community engagement is an absolutely essential part of planning and land use decisions and leading uh, some of these uh, regulatory ideas to final approval. Uh, we are at, um, 259. Uh, and so I don't believe we have time for a robust um, Q&A, but I do want to acknowledge um, all of the comments in both the chat box uh, as well as the Q&A box. And I wanted to give a little bit of time as well for the contact information um, for our presenters. Thank you to all of you for sharing your expertise today. Uh, and to our attendees for your participation. Uh, I will leave this contact slide up on the screen for one moment. And we would also like to share with you again, the research that has been conducted by HUD, the Frontier Institute and the Mercatus Center. These links too are up here on the screen. Our presentation will be posted to the registration page in the coming weeks. Please join us next Wednesday, July 26th for the final webinar in the Barriers to Affordable Housing series.
Thank you very much.